no longer lost with Christ and your father's introducing you uh, in the household of God. It's really sweet. I also saw when we walked out there, I did see someone was state bound. I wanted to congratulate you on that and remind you, maybe it's there in the children's room, but whoever it was, don't forget to give your creator glory for creating you and giving you those talents that you're blessed to show to everyone. And I wanted to thank Tommy too, because at first I thought it was coincidental, the song choices, but you picked a lot of beautiful songs, brother, and not to engage our souls, and it goes along with what we're talking about. Today we're gonna talk about real friendship, real friendship, and what that looks like. Because I didn't know the demographic of the congregation here, I didn't know how old, if it was an older congregation, younger, but at any age, any age, we desire companionship. No matter how old we get, how young we are, we all desire real friendship. And so we're gonna look at what that looks like today because we all desire it and we don't really know what real friendship is until we're in Christ, until we're connected with God. That's when we're really exposed to the depth of friendship because Jesus Christ is the best friend ever. And when he shows you his loyalty and his encouragement and his steadfastness, that opens up every new possibility in a friendship and it blesses it allows you to have real friendships. And so anytime you're looking for a real friendship or an example of it, you need to look at David and Jonathan in First and Second Samuel. Obviously, Jesus Christ is the best friend, but Jonathan and David set a perfect example of what real friendship looks like, and so we'll look at them together today. And we'll see that a good friendship rooted in God, if it's rooted in God, It'll produce loyalty, it'll produce intercession, and it'll produce encouragement, unlike anything else that this world could offer or any friendship could offer. And so we'll start with loyalty today. And we'll look at David and Jonathan's example of loyalty. And we'll be in 1 Samuel 18, 1 Samuel 18, and verse 1. 1 Samuel 18 and verse 1 it says, Now when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Important context here is that Jonathan is Saul's son, meaning that Jonathan is the son of a king. He's in the premier position to inherit the kingdom, he would have all the riches, he would have the best everything. David, King David, who would become King David, was a poor shepherd. Two totally different walks of life. One's poor, one's rich, one's exalted, one's lowly. But they had the same great faith, and their souls were knit together. Because what Jesus said, the most important commandment, if you don't grasp any other commandment, Grasp Matthew 22, 36 through 38, to love your creator, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And when both parties in a friendship could do that, that's a real living friendship. That knits souls together. And we look at their example of loyalty a couple verses down in verse four of 1 Samuel 18 where Jonathan displays his loyalty to David. And it says, verse 4, says, And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, even to his sword and his bow and his belt. This is a normal gesture. In combat and battle at this time, men would exchange armor. It would be relatively common for men to exchange armor with each other. But the son of a king doing this for a shepherd was not common. It would be like one of us giving our most prized possession, whatever our most valuable material asset that we know we have, giving that to someone. And that's the sign of a real friendship because he knows that giving that to him, he's going to carry on the same mission that he would have. They both loved God with all their heart, 
all their mind and all their soul. So he has no problem giving the best of the best material-wise to him because he knows his friend, his real friend, will carry on that same love and that same mission. No competition. You see that a lot in non-real friendships. There's fleshly competition with material, with whatever, but not in this one. He gave the best of what he had because there is no competition in a real friendship where the goal and the hearts and the minds are all on Jesus Christ or all on God. It eliminates the competition. You're all going to the same goal. And you want the other friend to get there before you. It's a selfless friendship. David's loyalty to Jonathan surpasses death, Lord willing, the real friendships that we're blessed to have. And as we go through this, think about these qualities and think about if you really possess them in your friendships. If your friendships are real, if you have these qualities of loyalty, intercession, and encouragement, and then also think of the people that you consider friends if they have these qualities. So you could tell, hey, I'm not being a real friend according to how God wants me to, or this person that I consider to be a friend, they're actually not really. And then we'll see how God is the perfect, perfect friend. And we'll look at how God's the most loyal. We'll look at that one attribute right now, his loyalty. God was, we talked about this in our Bible class some, Genesis 3.15 is the first messianic prophecy in the entire Bible. It's after the fall of man, when they eat of the fruit, the forbidden fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. All that unfolds. God says that the seed of the serpent will bite the heel of the seed of the woman, but the seed of the woman, which we know is Jesus Christ, will crush the head of the serpent. All the way from Genesis to Revelation, he was loyal to that. Jesus did crush the head of the serpent. He did defeat death. He did defeat sin. So we see that God's already the best friend, and he shows that with his loyalty first, his steadfast loyalty. He's loyal in sending his son Jesus to save us. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He was loyal to that. And Lord willing, if you're a believer today, you could testify to that. I'm walking in eternal life because God was loyal to that promise. I'm a beneficiary, a humble beneficiary of that because God was loyal to it. He took our sins on the cross. We just commemorated him in the Lord's Supper. He was loyal to all of that. So how could we not be loyal in our friendships? Our Lord, the one that pulled us out of darkness to light, did everything he promised. Are we mirroring that in our friendships and are our friends mirroring that to us is the question. We've all heard that this expression, you're better off having one real friend, just one real friend, than a thousand acquaintances. And that's so true. Most people don't know that the Bible says that in its own phrasing. When it says in Proverbs 18:24, it says, a man of too many friends comes to ruin but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Find that one if you're blessed and pray to God for it. Be that one friend to someone or find that one friend that sticks closer than a brother. It makes your walk in Christ that much better. Don't surround yourself with people for false comfort or for temporary comfort. Find that one friend that's loyal. Loyalty and good and godly friendships is to Jesus Christ, first and foremost. A good way, a litmus test, to see if you're in a real and living friendship. John 15, 5, Jesus says that he's the vine. He is the vine. He's the source of life. We're the branches. Without him, you could do nothing. So in a real friendship, both parties are loyal and connected to the vine. The loyalty on both sides is to Jesus Christ, first and foremost. Then you'll have a living friendship. Loyalty and friendship encourages openness and honesty. This is essential too, which is needed for us to bear each other's burdens. Galatians 6.2 says, bear, bear ye one another's burdens so as to fulfill the law of Christ. He bore, and Lord willing, you could testify of this too. He bore that weight. He bore all those burdens. So in a real living friendship, you're doing that for each other. 
you're not just accommodating each other's need for companionship, but you're literally, they know that you could bear burdens upon them, and they know likewise that you're open and honest with them to bear their burden too. That's a real friendship. That's a loyal friendship. Because you know that I'm not going to make fun of you if you pour your burdens on me, and I know that you won't do the same if I pour my burdens on you. Because we're both humble and naked before Jesus Christ, first and foremost. So intercession. We see loyalty. God models it perfectly. Jonathan and David modeled it. And in a real friendship, both parties are loyal in that same way. Likewise, there's intercession, which, if you're confused by that term, that simply means stepping in the gap. If I were to intercede for you, I would step in the gap for you, defend your character, defend you in whatever way. That's intercession, stepping in the gap. We'll see Jonathan's example in 1 Samuel 20. It's about a page over, so. 1 Samuel 20, 32 to 33. Jonathan repeatedly does this for David. He, he is repeatedly interceding and stepping in the gap for David, putting his own life at risk for David because he loves him, because he's a real friend to him. 1 Samuel 20, 32 to 33. And it says, And Jonathan answered Saul his father and said to him, Why should he be killed? What has he done? Then Saul cast a spear at him to kill him, by which Jonathan knew that it was determined by his father to kill David. We see that modeled, and then we see Jesus saying in John 15, 13, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And other good litmus tests, if you're in a real friendship, is are you willing to put your life on the line, hypothetically and really, for that friend? If you're blessed to have that one friend that sticks closer than a brother or a sister, you would be because you know they're loyal to Christ first and foremost. If, if we're in a real friendship and I, I'm, I'm willing then to put my life on the line for you because I know that in my absence, you'll carry on shining the light of Christ and that's what matters. And so let's look at how God, again, is the best friend, not just in loyalty, but in intercession, too. 1 Timothy 1.5. There's one God, a fundamental of the faith. There's one God and one mediator between God and man, and that's the man, Christ Jesus. He literally is our intercessor. He is our mediator, and he's the best mediator we could ever ask for. Hebrews 7.25 says he always lives to make intercession for us. If you're blessed to be in Christ, baptized, sins are washed away, and Christ is your mediator, he lives to make intercession for you. So in a real friendship, how apt should we be to intercede for our friend? We have the best mediator and intercessor anyone could ask for. How apt and quick are we to be to intercede for our friend? And right now we're thinking, do our friends intercede for us that quickly or that readily or that confidently? Romans 8.34 says, Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. We don't just have someone who always lives to make intercession for us. It's the Son of God. It's the one who died and rose. So we're covered. We kind of talked about this a little bit in our Bible class, too. We're covered in Jesus. We're protected in Jesus. We're interceded for in Jesus. So in a real friendship, we're doing that for our friend too, and they're doing that for us because we're both fully protected by him. The Spirit of God makes intercession for us too. Romans 8, 26, we kind of talked about that too. But in friendship, we need to intercede in prayer. So you say, how do I intercede for my friend? You do it in prayer. You go into prayer on their behalf. 1 John 5, 16, it says there's a sin leading to death, but there's also a sin not leading to death. And John says by the Holy Spirit that you should pray for that. Are you in a real friendship where you're praying for your friend's sins so that they're healed, they're recovered, they could get back on the path of life and light? And are they praying for you? 
That's a really quick way to discern, too, if you're in a real friendship. Does your friend pray for you? James 5.16 says, To confess your sins and pray for one another, that you may be healed. It has to go both ways. You have to confess your sins to your friend. They have to confess their sins to you, and you pray for each other. That's where the healing takes place. And in a healed friendship, that's where life is. That's where vibrancy is. That's where God can shine. We need to have friends that are worthy of intercession too, though. This, this should go without being said, but 1 Corinthians 15, 33, bad company corrupts good morals. We need to have people that are worthy of our intercession. We don't want to be interceding for someone who has no interest in Christ or is living in sin. We want a vibrant living friendship where we're praying because we know they want to walk in the light. Bad friends equals bad intercession. And we need to have the love. This is the most important part. We want to live how we want to live. We want to be comfortable, do our own thing, take care of ourselves. But we have to have the love to intercede for our friends. Because Jesus did. Luke 23, 34, again, in our Bible class. Come to Chris's Bible classes. You'll hear all this, some of this stuff. Jesus said on the cross, Father, forgive them. After they spat on him, they mocked him, they, they're crucifying him. And he's saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He's, saying, he's interceding and saying, forgive them. Acts 7, Stephen's doing the same thing. The Jews are gnashing their teeth. They're going to stone him. And he's saying the same kind of plea, to interceding for these people that are going to kill him. In a real friendship, even in our friend's worst season, when they're being bogus to us or they're being mean to us or they're going through this spot in life and they're projecting this at us, they're not being a good friend, we still have the love to intercede for them. Because Jesus did for us and because in a real friendship you intercede for your friends. Encouragement. Real living friendship has loyalty. Real friendship has intercession in it both ways and encouragement this is the most exciting part uh brother that uh, did the devotional for the lord's supper was talking about you know getting amped up and encouraged where do you think the greatest source of encouragement comes from it comes from jesus christ it comes from having the holy spirit of god dwelling with god having him in you and growing in you that's what shines and so Jonathan's example of encouragement we see in 1 Samuel 23. 1 Samuel 23, 15 to 16. It says, So David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life, and David was in the wilderness of Ziph in a forest. Then Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David in the woods and strengthened his hand in God. Verse 16 is the key part. And if you do not have this in your friendship, it's going to get choked out. It's going to grow stale. It's not going to be a real living friendship. He strengthened his hand in God. Jonathan strengthened David's hand in God. This is one person of God building up the other person of God in spirit. The world cannot do this. The world does not have the Holy Spirit. The world is not connected to the true vine. It's only in Christ and in a real living friendship where you could build someone's hand up in God so they don't just walk away temporarily encouraged. You look good. You're, you're still on the right track, buddy. But no, a real building up where you could walk away solid in your spirit and confident and grounded. That only exists in a real living, godly friendship. Again, God is the greatest encourager. We see that in the Old and in the New Testament. Joshua 1.9, God's telling his people, they're going into this, what looks like an impossible situation. He's saying, be strong and courageous, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. That's the most encouraging thing ever, and they took that on because they knew that the Lord their God was with them wherever they go. It was not just hollow words. He's the greatest encourager. And his encouragement is like fuel to us. New Testament, Matthew 28, 20, Jesus says, Lo, 
I am with you always, he promises his disciples, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. If that isn't encouraging you, Lord willing, you could recalibrate your mind and realize that if you are in Christ, that promise is to you. He will be with you to the end of the age, to the end of the world. And if that's not your encouragement, that's not your fuel, what is? And how quickly does it burn out? Because this does not burn out. I could look to Jesus. You could look to Jesus with your heart and your mind at any moment if you're in him. Again, adds more encouragement. Jesus says, these things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. That's a promise. Jesus overcame the world. Why is that encouraging? Because we're overcomers in him. We have the solid rock we sing about to lean on. That's so encouraging. He lifts us up above all the tribulations here. And Lord willing, you could testify of that in your life and in your walk. In friendship, encouragement makes for an impactful friendship. It's not just internal. If there's real godly encouragement in a friendship, it shines outwardly too. So people are like, wow, this is a real dynamic too. Oh, wow, this is a real, this is a special friendship. This is a special group of people. Proverbs 27, 17, iron sharpens iron. So one person sharpens another. Good thing to reflect on right now in my friendship, who I consider my friend, are we sharpening each other? Are we having an effect on each other? Not just in a physical or fleshly way, mentally or physically, but in a spiritual way where we're coming out encouraged. When we interact or hang out with them, we're actually coming out bold in spirit, encouraged, happy in our spirit, not temporary, because we're sharpening each other by the spirit of God. Is that happening? And are we doing it? A friendship rooted in Jesus Christ is the greatest form of encouragement, not just because of the power and encouragement he gives, but because the faith provides mutual encouragement. The faith itself, Romans 1.12, energizes each other. Are you getting excited? Can your friend talk about their faith and how their walk's been and how strong their faith has grown? That, and that encourages you? And likewise, you talking about your faith and how living it is, how alive it is, that encourages your friend. And it propels the friendship to shine the light of Christ. And then Galatians 5, to 23, his love, his joy, his peace, his long suffering, his gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, the self-control, all those fruits of the spirit in a real friendship, those are flowing back and forth because you're connected to the true vine, Jesus Christ, who gives that fruit. Is that in your friendship? You have that in your friendship. The fruit of the Spirit flowing back and forth. And so a godly friendship rooted in Jesus Christ, if it really is, it produces loyalty, real loyalty that surpasses anything the world could offer and the people in it, and real intercession, real prayer for each other, real stepping in the gap, and real you knowing your friend will do it for you too and real encouragement, real encouragement that you can't even explain because it touches you in your soul, unlike any encouragement or motivational talk anyone could offer. And all of us need and crave this, whether anyone wants to admit it or not, from cradle to grave, we crave companionship and fulfilling companionship. We try to find it in all the wrong places. And we saw David and Jonathan model a real friendship. That ought to be the example and if you want a loving friendship like you never knew before, I could promise you, and Lord willing, other people could testify, if you want the best friend of all time, get yoked up with Jesus Christ. Be baptized, have those sins washed away, and lean on him with everything you got. He will always be loyal. He will always step in the gap for you, and he'll always be a source of encouragement. He has not failed me a single time since I've been with him and since he's been in me. And I know that other people could testify of that too, that are in him. So please, if you're a Christian and you haven't been a good friend, you're not exhibiting these characteristics, you're not in a living friendship, please repent. We'll pray for you right now. We'll intercede. 
and give you the strength and Lord willing you're healed like he promises so you could be a real living friend. And if you're not a Christian, please, 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 for the sake of your soul and for everyone else, get plugged in with the best friend of all time so you could really bless other people and the people that you call friends right now. Please come up while we stand and sing.